ultimate reality. Ah. Is there any, how does the brain tell what's re real and what's not real? Is there any way the brain can know what's real or not real? It's not a clear explanation as to why our brain thinks that something feels real. There are certainly parts of our brain that help us to interpret the information that we have within ourselves, uh, that is, comes into us from the outside world, that allows us to put together a very vivid picture of what's going on out there. But why we actually perceive that sense of reality to be the most real is not a clear uh, answer. There's not a clear answer to that yet. People have done some studies looking at hallucinations and what the difference is between something that somebody envisions to be real versus something that somebody actually does see and what the differences are in the brain. It does appear to have something to do with parts of the brain called the limbic system, which is involved in our emotional processing, and also another structure called the anterior cingulate, which is very involved in our ability to process emotions and also to focus our mind and focus our attention on different things. So it may be some relationship between these structures and these functions that actually identify something as being real and having that that realness feel to it, but why that happens and, and exactly why that happens in particular circumstances and why certain types of experiences like dreams may feel a little less real than our everyday reality and why mystical experiences feel more real than our everyday reality is, is not something that's clear at this point. Uh, so it, it, it's a very important question that we have to address, but uh, it, it really, it, and it stems from a very important problem that we as human beings must face, which is how do we really know what's out there, what's outside of our brains, and is there some way that we can get outside of our brains uh, or, or have the brain get out of its own way in order to see what is really out there. Uh, and I think that while on one hand science helps us to get part of the way there, what's interesting is that in these mystical experiences that people have, one of the descriptions that they give to it is that it is perceived of as being prior to uh, a subjective or objective sense of reality, meaning that it is it's really something that exists before we as human beings begin to apply our mental processes to it. It's something that, which is why it feels so fundamentally real. But what, so it's possible that through spiritual practices and spiritual experiences that we gain access to some level of reality that we don't normally have access to. The real question though is, is how are we actually able to do that? And what is it that we're actually touching when we do touch mm -hmm. those levels? When people have a, a, a mystical experience, what usually happens, how they describe it, is that they begin to lose the usual sense of material reality around them. In fact, if they go far enough and they achieve a sense of absolute unitary experience, then all of the material world as we typically know it basically goes away. What we're talking about there is an experience of just pure being, pure awareness, pure consciousness. So it's not it's not necessarily tied to anything material and because those experiences have been described in extremely real terms meaning that when people have that experience they perceive it to represent a more fundamental level of reality than our everyday material reality that we normally live in it creates a very big philosophical problem because when we actually try to evaluate what is real and, and how we know what is real my colleagues and I have ultimately come to the conclusion that the only way to really make a determination is based on how real it feels, what the sense of it feels. Everything ultimately is reduced to that experience. How real uh, of an experience does it feel? How much does it feel like absolute reality? Well, in that case, when we look at the mystical experiences, they really are associated with an experience of much more fundamental reality than what our everyday reality is like. In fact, even when they're no longer having that mystical experience, they still perceive that reality to be the more real, to represent the more truer form, the more fundamental form of reality. And the material world that we live in is kind of a more secondary reality for them. So if that's the case, then we need to really look at what is the relationship between consciousness and material reality, whether or not the material world can actually be derived from a consciousness reality, or whether consciousness itself could even be the fundamental stuff of the universe, so to speak, instead of the cold dark matter or the other aspects of matter that physicists have been looking for. Maybe it has something more to do with consciousness. And certainly if somebody comes at it from a spiritual or religious perspective, where, and particularly a theistic perspective where they're talking about God as the fundamental cause of all being. So everything in the universe basically derives from God's consciousness and in that regard
uh, then we really can think about the universe as being more a, a state of consciousness or more uh, inundated with consciousness much more so than the material reality that we normally look at. So going back to the idea of what really is consciousness, it really depends on a person's perspective. If somebody wants to be a very materialistic scientist, somebody may say, well, it's just the functioning of the human brain that allows us to be self-aware or aware of our surroundings that allows us to get around the world and survive. The only problem with that is that it's still very difficult to explain how a mass of neurons and, and, and cells and so forth can ultimately become aware of itself and why it is that if you put the same stuff together in another way or you take a huge uh, supercomputer with millions of circuits all running at incredible speeds and so forth that why that doesn't have consciousness and we don't know the answer to that just yet and why it seems at least at this point that human beings seem to be at least the greatest source of consciousness in, the, in, in, our, in our world are you saying, so that I understand, yes. that when we're in an absolute unitary state, that is more reality than this out here? Well, that's how it's described by the people who have it. And that's really been shown across the board. It, there are many different kinds. It doesn't even have to be an absolute unitary state, but a very strong mystical experience. People who have near-death experiences, people who have spontaneous mystical experiences, people who've been meditating for many years and get a sense of enlightenment or some type of mystical uh, experience as the result of that practice. All of those different types of experiences, even if it doesn't go to the extreme of just everything being wiped out and, and having an absolute sense of oneness, uh, these very powerful mystical experiences are perceived to represent a truer form of reality, a more fun fundamental level of reality that makes this material world really not mean as much. And you know, some people have described it as an illusion, which I think is sometimes a little strong, but, but I think the point they're trying to make is, is that it just doesn't have the, the realness, the quality of realness that these states have. And the, the ultimate goal of the mystic then, once they've had that experience, is to kind of keep trying to get back to that experience because that is, in, in their eyes, what represents the fundamental level of reality. So uh, then what is reality? I mean, basically, you got to just answer that, really. I mean. Well, what reality is, is, is a, that's the, the kind of the crux of the question. When we've looked at the, how we define reality as, as a human being, we looked at the criteria of which we evaluate reality and say, well, what is, what is it that makes something real? I mean, there were philosophers in the past that said, look, if I, if I kick a rock and I, and I hurt my toe, that's real. You know, I feel that, it, it feels real, it's vivid, and uh, that, re that means that it's reality. Uh, but it's still an experience, and it's still this person's perception of it being real. So that's certainly one characteristic, which is that it feels real. We bump into things in the real world, uh, we hear things, we hear sirens and so forth, and, and they all sound and feel and appear very vivid, very real to us. They are also consistent. They, you know, if we see a car driving down the street, it just doesn't disappear. It keeps going, there's a consistency over time, and we have a sense that when something no longer is there, that it has now ceased to exist in that reality. Uh, and we also can do a cross comparison. I can ask you, what do you see over there? And you say, I see a blue car. And I say, I see a blue car. That, that cross-references cross me, and I can say, okay, that represents reality. The problem is, is that if we actually look at all of those criteria about cross-referencing and persistence over time and, and the, the feeling of it being real, all of those still ultimately come back to how real it feels to us because when I cross-reference with somebody, they're part of my reality. So it's still a matter of if I hear somebody agreeing with what I think is going on out there, it still has to do with, with what I am perceiving and whether or not what I perceive uh, is ultimately what I interpret as being real. So when, when, when we try to break it down, it, it appears that, that reality ultimately comes down to our experience, to the strength at which we, we sense it. And one of the things that is very important, I think, in terms of evaluating reality is how it compares to our other experiences of reality. So for example, if we have a dream at night, it may seem very real and very vivid, but when we wake up, we usually say, you know what, that was a dream. It's not, it doesn't have that same persistence, it doesn't have that same quality that this reality has. Even though when you're in it, it may feel very real, when you're in this reality, that reality seems secondary. So in many ways, reality can be very relative. And then of course, when people have a mystical experience, that feels very real. And at that point, they feel that that's more real. But 
the interesting thing there is that even though they may not be in that mystical experience anymore, when they're in this baseline reality, they still think that that reality was more real. So it's different than the dream state where we say that wasn't real, because now we're saying it still feels more real, even though I don't have any connection to it right now. I still know that that was more real. And, and we see that time and time again. Even people who are not designed to be mystics, people with near-death experiences, always describe that that experience, that sense that they had, the feelings that they had with that, were, are more real, that makes this reality a whole different situation for them. And, and it's been documented in many studies that have shown that when people have a near-death experience, it changes their, their perspective on life, their fear of death, their interpersonal relationships, how they approach their life, how they approach their jobs, their children, their family. So it has very dramatic effects, speaking to the fact that it really felt very real and really had a life-changing consequence for them.